All right. Well, hello and welcome to the ADHC Talks. I'm your host, Sarah Whitfer, and I'm so happy that y'all have chosen to join me today. Um, the ADHC Talks is a video podcast hosted by the Alabama Digital Humanities Center. It is live streamed and recorded on Zoom, and then it's captioned and posted on YouTube, and it lives on our ADHC website. This is our fourth and final episode of the semester, fall 2023. Our guests today are Sarah Bryant and David Allen. Sarah Bryant is assistant professor for the MFA Book Arts Program at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. She's produced an artist book. Uh, she produced, has produced artist books and prints under the name Big Jump Press since 2005. That's a weird way to say that. <laughs> Her work can be found in dozens of libraries and private collections in the United States and abroad, including my home um, and the Library of Congress and the New York Public Library and the Darling Biological Biomedical Library Center at UCLA and Yale Arts Library. Dave Allen is Associate Professor of Biology at Middlebury College, where he studies the ecology of ticks and tick-borne diseases. Dr. Allen has published his work in numerous journals, including the Journal of Medical Entomology, Biological Conservation, Emerging Infectious Disease, and Northeastern Naturalist. His research on ticks and tick-borne pathogens is funded by a grant from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. During our podcast, I'll be asking a set of questions which have already been shared with our guests, and I've invited them to prepare any visuals that they want to share during our talk. Our conversation will be guided by these questions, but we're always welcome to follow the conversation wherever it takes us. So Sarah and Dave, I'm gonna ask my first question, and this is always my favorite question. Tell me about your research. And the thing that I am most interested in is what makes you feel nerdy and excited? I will start and I will say that, um, so my research is um, printing and designing and binding artist books. I'm a printer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher. Um, and I get into the tall grass and into the weeds about things like inking and impression and all that kind of, uh, physical production side stuff. But also, um, I spend a lot of time, um, researching and designing these book projects. So talking to people who know a lot more than I do about certain things, um, or reading around certain subjects and, um, then all of my projects end up hopefully being quite different from one another. They might be about, for example, a book that Dave and I have done together was about world populations a few years ago. Another project is about archives. Another project is about the um, biological composition of our bodies. So I, I kind of try to do a lot of different things at once. And it basically means that given the year or whatever project I'm working on, I'm a big dork about one particular thing. <laughs> Great. I, uh, I'm an ecologist, so I study the interactions between organisms and uh, different different species of organisms, and then also the organisms and their environment. And um, so I'm interested in how those interactions determine why we find lots of or some species in some places and not in other places, or why there's lots one year, but then few other years. Um, and uh, so right now I'm applying that work to ticks um, and tick-borne diseases. Uh, and so um, like Sarah, I also get into the tall grass and the weeds, but literally get into the tall grass and weeds and go out into the field and look for ticks. Um, and then also measure the other aspects uh, of a habitat that would determine how many ticks there are. So how many hosts there are, how many deer there are, how many mice there are, um, and then do some experiments uh, to sort of understand other aspects of the ticks in the field, take the ticks back to the lab and test them for tick-borne pathogens with a PCR test, just like, you know, the COVID PCR test. Um, and then I'm also really interested then in sort of trying to understand how can we make sense of all that? because there are these like 
huge web of ecological complexity. Um, and I use mathematical and computational models to help me make under, understand that. Um, and so definitely what, what I nerd out about is one, just like, how do you understand the world around you? And for me, that's about the um, ecological world. And then, but I'm also very secretly a math nerd. And so some points I just try to, uh, I want to use the math because I like math. So that's where I'm nerdy about. I love that. Um, so I, uh, I was actually showing the, um, the tick, the tick, um, edition of the acts of translation to a librarian friend the other day. And she started squealing. She was like, that's R. That's <laughs> R. <laughs> so exciting to her. She's like the person in the, our library who is in charge of all things R studio. <laughs> and she was so excited to see it in there. I think Sarah, I think you were there when, when it was, she, it was over. Yeah. It and was my, great. And I, you know, I know nothing about R, you know, I know. Me, it looks like gibberish, but I was so excited because I was like, yes, this is my, my project. <laughs> well, but I think that that is, um, that's a really common aspect of digital humanities collaboration is often there is a sub, like a subject or some sort of functional, you know, everybody has their own role and not everybody knows all of the different computer programming languages or the platforms or the processes, but together you're able to use these mixed methodologies and these mixed technologies that you couldn't use on your own to produce something that you're unable to produce without that collaboration. And I think, I think that that's something that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I do this podcast is because I want new DH scholars to be able to understand how collaborations are developed and how they are, how you can get a project together and executed when you find people who can partner with you, right? It, it might be helpful if I, I can share my screen and show yeah. kind of the sort of collaborations that Dave and I have done in the past um, and the project that I've been working on now with multiple collaborators. And then it can be a little bit more clear how we can bring our weird nerdiness sort of together. That'd be so great. Why don't I find my PowerPoint? Okay. And I'm going to go to the beginning and... Um, start it. Um, this is from a talk I recently gave for um, CARI, which is the Collaborative Arts Research uh, Initiative that um, funded a lot of the work that Dave and I have recently done and that I've been doing recently. Um, and it's a great um, sort of community building um, fellowship that I had with CARI over the last two years that sponsors yeah. uh, research. If any of our uh, viewers who have watched our other video podcasts, if you've seen Rebecca Salters or Amanda Coes, they were also part of the Cary um, group. So you are our third Cary fellow uh, to be on the podcast. I think it's, I mean, it's, it, it's natural because of the way that Cary is kind of encouraging folks to cross disciplines and uh, work together to create work that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And that's certainly what happens with me and Dave. We have very different skill sets and very different interests, but they align in certain ways. And then we can make these projects that would be impossible for either of us on our own. And we've been working together for a long time. I actually think our first project that we made together was in 2013. Wow. So 10 years, right. ago. 10 years ago, uh, and we had been kind of trying to do things earlier than that. And I should say, I want to do full disclosure now and say that Dave and I are cousins. We have known each other for our entire lives. Full well, disclosure. Uh-huh. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. And no. I don't only collaborate with cousins, <laughs> <laughs> but Dave and I, we also went to college together uh, as undergraduates. So we just have had a lot of time to talk and um, kind of get interested in what each other are doing. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how, how we started and, and years and years ago, maybe as early as 2008 or 2009, we started kind of getting together and I would get Dave on the press and he would talk to me about at the time, his dissertation research, which was on witch hazel. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we've just been talking for a long, long time. I'm going to switch the slide just to show the kind of work that I do. And in fact, I, I, if you can see, does my arrow show up hovering around? Yes. This was our first project here um, in our first like full finished project, uh, which I can't link to because this is a screenshot, but it was a project where I just used, it was more of a me stealing Dave's language and making my own project than anything else, but I took language from uh, his dissertation and put it into an artist book project um, because of an exhibition invitation that required collaboration. I didn't used to collaborate and I kind of like resisted collaboration in a lot of, I, I was kind of like horrified at the idea of collaborating with anybody. And so my world has changed a lot in the last 10 years. I collaborate all the time. But just to say very briefly, uh, that the research that I do, this is what it looks like. These are these artist books. I produce them in small editions. I do most of that work by hand, uh, operating a printing press or hand book binding. Um, the design is all mine and uh, often in collaboration though with other artists or with people who are in other disciplines like Dave. Um, the Acts of Translation project that I've been working on now currently has five collaborators and I'm, I'm kind of winding it down. I had really hoped to incorporate um, additional folks. Amanda Coe, who did one of these lectures or these talks with you, Sarah, was initially part of this list and it kind of breaks my heart that, I, that my deadline sort of made it impossible for me to continue with everybody. Um, but at the moment, these are the folks who are uh, a part of this project. Um, and the way that this project works is that I spoke with each of these folks, uh, starting with a kind of standard interview um, and then branching out into larger conversations, which I recorded, asking them questions about how they define the word translation in their work, if there is a definition of translation in their work, how they imagine themselves to be engaged in acts of translation in their daily life or in their kind of work. Um, and then, with each of them, I identified a kind of particular act of translation. And we defined that pretty broadly to say, you know, um, any kind of transmission, like conversion and transmission of information. And so for Dave, who was one of the first folks that I was really working with about this, we were talking about how Dave uses his skills and interests and um you know, his world to translate an ecological system, Dave, you're going to have to like totally correct all the stuff that I'm saying, but translates an ecological system, which in his case is a, a tick population into a mathematical model. So what that process is for him and also what the importance of that process is. So um, I, I think I'll just stop talking there and I'll let Dave talk a little about what that is and what that means and how he, you know, experience this process of discussion go yes so um <laughs> yeah i loved this idea of um of translation and for me you know the one, one of the first things that came to mind was how do i translate an ecological system into a mathematical model and why would i want to do that what are the steps to do that um and so the upshot for me is you can use a mathematical model um well, what you want to do is this model is an abstraction or a simplification of the very messy, complicated world that, you know, we can't totally understand. But if we can pare down to the things that we think are the, you know, salient drivers in this case of a tick population, part of that is just interesting because it forces you to, um, to think about like, what do you think is what drives a tick population? How much of it is the deer population versus the temperature um, versus the structure of the leaf litter that they live in? And then can we then encode that into some simple rules um, that again, just like forces you to um, like put your thoughts um, in a more very formal um, structure. Uh, so that is the like the part of um, modeling that I, I find very interesting and rewarding um, and helps then just like shows you what you do or you don't know about the system to begin with. Um, and that like sort of active translation or what it was very interesting to me. Um, and then obviously, if you have a model, then um, it can be very helpful in, you know, projecting, you know, if 
as long as the model is does a good job of like how many ticks will there be next year how many ticks will there be under different climate change scenarios or what if we were able to um vaccinate half of the mice in the field then how many how many ticks would uh be infected um and you can sort of interrogate those more applied questions um with the model i don't know if that answers the question but that's sort of just like why i think that modeling is interesting and then but the key part is this sort of like how do you translate the world into a system of mathematical equations one thing that i think was interesting about this whole process working with dave but also working with um, allison grant who's a photographer here at the university of alabama um, luveda a. harrison she's also at the university of alabama um, these are folks i met through the carry um, fellowship um, uh, luveda is a, a soprano performer and an educator um, and then Ben Mitchell, who's a type designer in the UK, um, and Sonia Dupre, who's an uh, elementary Spanish teacher. One of the things that was interesting is that there's also this act of translation that's sort of like outside of the subject matter, which is that, first of all, I'm having to ask these folks to translate their experience to me. So they have to explain what they're talking about. And this image that I popped up is... Um, something I asked Dave to do while he was here was to draw this kind of flow diagram or flow chart of the kind of life cycle of these ticks as he was, you know, as that, to explain how he would begin the model making. But the same process would be happening with me for Alison Grant, talking to her about what, how she selected these images. And so there's, there's this act of translation that I'm doing as an artist, trying to, first of all, kind of synthesize all of these different voices to think about how each of their stories can be in parallel to one another, but also how, because I am editing the text from the interviews that I'm doing with these folks, it's actually my voice also that's a part of the language of the book. So each of the, I should show, in fact, let me stop sharing my, well, actually, maybe I can, I know that's the code. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and I'm going to um, show a copy of this finished version of the book. Each of these books, oh, I'm going to do something weird and run away and run back. Each of these books <laughs> happens in like two ways. We lost Sarah. I know. I know. Wouldn't it be funny if I just never came back? They, they, first, I have been issuing them uh, individually. So this is Ben Mitchell, the type designer. This is Dave Allen, um, who we are talking to right now, and uh, Allison Grant. Um, and over there, I'm currently binding the subsequent two um, components of the book. Now that they're all finished, I'm creating an edition where they all go together in this um, kind of format that what I like about this format uh, is that you can look at all of them at once and read across, or you can look at any two of them together. So here I can look at Dave Allen and Luveda A. Harrison and see how their text might echo each other. And so there's something kind of, um, this is, this, I've only just finished the first copy or two of the way these books all go together. And it's been very rewarding because I can see how those texts um, have these unexpected connections. Dave, of course, is speaking about climate change. Alison Grant's photography is also related to a climate crisis. I'm not saying that these things are all you know, really simple and that they dovetail perfectly, but there are these themes that are kind of overlapping, even as we're talking about translation or communication, we're also talking about what it is we're communicating and why. Um, so I kind of see myself in this role of, I'm also this, I'm kind of this like translator standing on top of all of this material, trying to kind of fit it all together and weave these stories together in certain ways. So one last thing, and then I'll let Dave speak because I feel like I'm being a bit over the top talking here, but I, in each of the paste downs for the book, I've got language from all of those collaborators kind of woven together uh, that you can maybe see or not see um, where it, it, some of the things that people were, you know, Dave would be speaking about 
the dirt and the leaf litter. And Alison Grant would be speaking about the earth and the soil. And it's just this kind of beautiful way that these things can go together. I'll go back to my screen and then um, we can answer more questions. Yeah, I think uh, I would like to dive into the next question, which I think is a really interesting question for this particular conversation, because neither of you traditionally consider yourselves digital humanists. Um, but what is your history with digital humanities? How much have you considered it in the past? And I consider this collaboration a lot to do with what we do in the digital humanities. And I'm wondering sort of, you've already answered the question of how you arrived at this project, but I, I'm interested to hear from you how you can conceptu conceptualize yourself within that sort of sphere of what we call digital humanities. Um, so that is my question. <laughs> Dave, do you have an answer first? <laughs> no, I think you should go first. <laughs> I, um, I, to be honest, you know, I don't really think about the digital humanities. I mean, I feel like it's something I'm engaged with, but it's not something that I'm really interrogating or thinking much about. Um, I am a person who's um, working with my hands quite a bit, but I'm using a lot of digital tools um, kind of in between and concurrently, you know, so I... I'm making these projects that in the end, they do exist primarily as a physical object, but I'm also documenting them pretty consistently, putting up videos of them. And the subject matter is often related to things that um, require, you know, a, a lot of different digital tools. Um, so I think that's, I guess, maybe a, a, a sort of vague answer to the question. I also think that I'm in this discipline that collaboration is sort of at the heart of book arts practice um, and historically has been a key part of working within these uh, traditions. So usually you've got, you know, book binders and printers and all those kinds of paper makers, calligraphers, all that, all the kind of individual disciplines that merge and overlap. Books are made by people who work together. And so um, that still remains to be true when you are thinking about books the way I do as an artist, I'm, I'm seeking uh, ways to incorporate new things and make new work using tools, using people, <laughs> using all kinds of things that I have at my disposal. So now it's your turn, Dave. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, um, I don't 100% know what digital humanities means. Um, so maybe that I guess I didn't do enough reading of the questions before, but um, <laughs> I, um, I definitely I am sort of like think of myself as you know a scientist and um am in my silo of like the classes that I teach are um science classes and you know the my research that I do is science and um so what I've really appreciated with Sarah is just uh thinking about this sort of like arts humanities collaboration with uh science and i think our first project was a little bit more mm. we're going to use the tool to like show you something and so it was uh, i was a little bit more sort of like science communication through art um which i which i loved and and i think that you know and maybe there were there was definitely digital uh methods quite um even though we printed them with analog, um, there's like intense digital methods to go through those data. Um, and so, I mean, I think that that probably would be digital humanities. Um, 100%. <laughs> um, digital methods are yeah. our methodology, you know, within the digital humanities. And I think that the, the conception that in order to be a part of digital humanities, you have to have like your presentation has to have like, mm purely digital like manifestation is it's a misconception um because a lot of digital humanities work ultimately gets published like any other scholarship gets published in that it turns into a journal article which is mm -hmm. text-based mm -hmm. right so I think one of the things that that 
happens at the nexus of these collaborations and specifically this one that that you all have done both the the figures and the tick project the 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 intense computational components of it being translated through art is is such a core humanist act right um because art is is a fundamental discipline within the humanities and it it works to explore what it means to be human in so many different ways and the tick project i think also explores sort of those ideas of post-humanism, right? We're still talking about entities and we're still talking about populations and growths and um, all kinds of different things, but we're also exploring like how that bumps into the human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm particularly interested for a moment to talk a little bit about, uh, so Sarah is thinking about putting together a website that has all all of the recorded interviews of the collaborations and a lot of process video and some really fun stuff which I also think you know that idea of documentation is also very important to the interdisciplinary digital humanities world right so um, I thought maybe maybe what I can do is show I know I've been zipping the slides around and I want to touch back to the population book, which we sort of briefly mentioned without explaining, um, but maybe we can do that in a minute. But I want to show uh, the book that Dave and I have made, which is a component of this larger book. So I, I have the book in my hands and, and I have the uh, video here, which I will try to play. It's also on my website, uh, which is bigjumppress.com. You can find all kinds of you know, projects there, uh, including acts of translation. And I'm on the way to putting new images up of the whole completed project. Um, but I thought I would play this video and perhaps read a, a, a portion of the text. So that I'll, I'll see if we can get this going. There we go. So, and these are Dave's words, but I have quite aggressively edited them uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll talk about it in a minute, I guess, but um, so a model has to be wrong. Why is the tick population changing? It is embedded in a complicated ecological system, a system which has also changed. Deer populations are different, forest structures different. The question can be hard to tease apart. I am an ecologist. I try to understand and describe the vast complexity of these biological processes. I want to predict the future with a nice, neat equation. A model is an abstracted, generalized expression of what we know about a system. If it is too complex, it will not be useful. Even a flow diagram is a model. Drawing one helps me translate a messy life cycle into something simple enough to communicate. Pools of populations and between each a flow or flux, a transition from one life stage to another. What we see now is going to be so different in 50 years. And I'll stop there for now. Um, whoops, let me get out of there. There we go. And so Dave's book, as I mentioned, it sits next to these others um, that while the text is different, I think the tone is similar because it is me who's kind of editing them and putting them together. I did a project several years ago about where I combined language from um, Plato's Republic and Le Corbusier's Radiant City. It was a totally different project. But one thing I realized was that the language fit together really nicely. And I have this suspicion, this is a real digression, but I had the suspicion that it's because of the time period of the translations, that the translations were done around the same time and that that made the language fit together. And I, th I think about that as I'm translating, as I'm kind of editing these different interviews, you know, I have hours of interviews and then I have these text documents that are just, you know, vast. And I'm going through physically with a highlighter and a pair of scissors and digitally with a lot of copy and pasting and all, all kinds of different things are happening. And so that intervention that I'm doing is certainly, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm creating a text that has my voice out of the language uh, from these other folks. And sometimes I do it and I think it works well. And other times, you know, I made this one edit to Dave's that it's so funny. It came up at a family reunion because as I mentioned, we were uh, cousins, but uh, where we were talking about this project to folks. And there's a moment where the, a moment that I really liked where Dave was talking about that some things are very difficult. I'll just read this passage and then we can talk about how I'm a criminal for what I did to Dave. But um, parts of the life cycle are easy to observe, but other parts are like dark matter. They are hidden. I never find any engorged ticks and I don't know exactly why. Some things are very difficult to measure. And I think that's so interesting, but it's also not entirely true because Dave does find engorged ticks. He just doesn't find them, what, in the leaf litter? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you only find like, them on an animal, yeah. On an animal. And so it, it was an it was an edit and I don't know, usually I feel like I run that stuff by or maybe it <laughs> came in and out, but I but in the end though, I like it better this way. And that is interesting like it's not entirely true but it's doing something that i wanted it to do which is to say echo this idea that a model has to be wrong that things are yeah different. it serves a higher truth right yes yeah. a literal <laughs> truth yeah exactly right you're making it it's funny too because this had this i had a conversation with the typo with the type designer where I was trying to set up the design. Working on the mock-up with him was very difficult in a great way because he's so invested in the way that the letter forms look and the design looks. So it was a very different process because he was very deeply involved. As far as even things like, I don't like that ligature that the type, which is a joined letter, like an FT is a ligature. Most people maybe don't even see them, but we're all using them all the time. It's one letter form designed together. So it would be, or no, I'm sorry, Ben would be looking very closely and he'd say, no, I don't like that ligature. Let's get rid of it. And he told me, you know, we were, I was trying to set up a system for the design of the book and it was about a line break. Where can I break this line? And there's one way to break it where the line would kind of, um, consistently work with the design principles that we kind of set up. And there was another way to break the line that was totally different, but it broke for meaning. And so we had a big conversation about breaking for meaning and how that was more important in that instance. And I feel like the same thing sort of is happening here where we're editing for meaning, but mm -hmm. not truth or the opposite. You know, I don't know. There's just some interesting things that I think that what I'm experiencing, which people won't necessarily experience when they look at the book, is this sort of all-inclusive experience of talking deeply about translation with all of these folks. I feel like I've lived inside this project for years now. It's been almost three years, I think. So I think for the website, getting back to the website, I feel like it's a possibility where I can um, put out there some of those experiences that I am having that could not possibly land in the books because these books they're not they have to be small they have to be short to do the job that they're doing also very interesting I just love talking to you about this stuff um I think one of the things that we've talked a lot about is your process and sort of what your goals are with this and I have an interesting question that is that is more for me than anything. And that is when you're making something like this and when you're collaborating with someone, how do you conceptualize audience? Um, both with this project specifically and and more broadly, when you are when you're putting something like this together, because audience changes a lot of the decisions that you're making, right? So I guess that's an interesting question for me. My background is rhetoric and audience is something that we talk a lot about. So um, I think it's interesting I'm maybe not. for us to look at our other project and talk about it, because I think that's one of the times when Dave and I both had to think carefully about, like this one is a little bit more subjective, yeah. but the, um, and I, Dave, I want, you to speak about this one. I feel like I'm um, talking maybe a little too much, but the I'll give the broad strokes of this and then I'll, I'll ask you a question, Dave, and then I'll let you take it away. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. 
this project is a book we did in 2015. So it was a while ago now. Um, and uh, the book is about world populations and also about how we describe world populations. Um, so what we did, uh, and I could not possibly have done this project without Dave, uh, is that we went to the uh, State Department uh, international database, which has figures, population figures, um, for every country on earth, country or region, they call it, they say region, um, and not all regions or countries. And we just took every region that they described. Um, and Dave created with that data population pyramids, which I have here kind of an, we did a Kickstarter for this project. So we have lots of kind of goofy images of it. Um, the, it, this is like the simplest and obviously a deeply flawed way of looking at a population. <clears throat> Clearly, it relies on a pretty serious gender binding, <laughs> like, but it is kind of a classic population um, data visualization kind of thing. Super simple way of seeing a population at a glance. So you've got um, men on one side, women on the other side, age going up. Um and what we did was that we took all of that data or Dave took all of that data and Dave created these uh, population pyramids. Uh, and we made, I guess there were 228 regions. So Dave made 228 pyramids and then we joined them to make them look sort of like human figures. Um, and here, here's some hope, here's some serious digital humanities action. <laughs> uh, and so we talked a lot about what, what the shape the the kind of width of those figures would be i mean dave did a lot of kind of sculpting to um make sure that we had kind of proportionally something that would fit well with a book form but there are lots of discussions about that and um we started to layer all of these figures uh played around with our ideas and in the end printed all of that material on drafting film and created an enclosure where the drafting film could be laid down upon a grid and interpreted, but also layered uh, and sort of played with. And you can see, you can compare and contrast. But one of the things about this is that the project is, the, it is even though this is data, data is subjective. And I feel like I had a lot of very interesting conversations with Dave about what that means, how we were we were incapable of interpreting this data because it was a snapshot, not you know a time. It's like if we did this book every year, we might be able to interpret what the data was saying. But at this stage, all we could do was kind of look at what was there. Speaking about audience, I know this is what we're getting to here. I also know that it was very important to Dave that we describe the methods, the sources, and all that kind of material because this is this I feel like was a project. I think these two projects are different in that the acts of translation project, I was kind of guiding it because you know, of the nature of this project. This project relied very, very heavily on uh, Dave's uh, areas of, uh, Dave's like abilities and skills. And so maybe, do you feel comfortable talking about audience for this book and your comfort level with making a work of art out of this data? And I'd be so interested to hear you speak about it. Yeah, definitely. And some of this, I, I, I mean, I'm not a social scientist. And so I also was worried about like, oh, you know, there's definitely different considerations when you're thinking about human populations and not human populations. And how do you represent them? And how do you do it with um, like a um, research integrity? integrity. Um, so that I think was was something that I, you know, and I talked to Sarah about and sort of worked through. Um, and then I really liked this, you know, um, ability to layer and so that the the reader could explore the data um, too. And so I, that this sort of um, form that Sarah and I came to together felt very rewarding that we could um you know that that the, the reader was really engaged with the material in this way that's different for a like a a standard format of a book um but then again because we were you know making these choices about how do you match up these two different countries and you know where are these data come from and you know um it felt important that we were very to me like very clear about each of those steps um and 
So in that is more of a, almost like what you would see in a scientific paper of, you know, these were, this is where we got the data from. These are the limitations of the data. This is the, you know, the, how they're incomplete or um, uh, the sort of like political uh, perspective from which they're, they're drawn. And then these are the steps that we took to, you know, make this um, smooth line. Uh, and these are the, uh, yeah, the technical steps that we did um, so that we could just be very transparent about that process. Like you you would in a scientific paper so that someone else could, you know, interrogate your methods or replicate your methods. Um, and so I don't know if we have, we probably don't have a picture, but that the part of then there is a little more traditional booklet in there that um, sort of walks through each of those um, steps. And then, yeah, I, audience, I think is super interesting. Um, uh, you know, when I write a scientific paper, I have a very like clear sense of who my audience is. And um, it's this totally narrow field of people who are going to read like the Journal of Medical Entomology. Um, and then, you know, maybe like they're going to skim the abstract. And then of that totally narrow field who reads the Journal of Medical Entomology, like, percent of them are going to then read my article based on the abstract because they're like tick nerds and not mosquito nerds or whatever. <laughs> um, and so this feels like so foreign to me of, um, you know, like, who is this audience? And like, um, and so, you know, I think some of it is then just like, well, I, yeah, I think for this one, I, I since I was more involved with the process and some of these design choices, um, I don't know if I still had an audience in mind, but it felt like I was thinking about the audience more, even if I didn't have like who that person was uh, in mind. One of the things I like thinking about with this project, this is so personal, not um, not necessarily about audience, but it's about Dave, is that when we finished this book, we were a finalist for an award, which was a really nice big book arts award. And you have to go and like, there's an envelope and they read a name, all that kind of stuff. And I was like living in England at the time. And I was nine months pregnant. Um, like I was so pregnant. And Dave went to this huge book art thing at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts. Dave, I like I always think about how wonderful it is that you went to represent us at this huge book arts event, you know, with all these book arts folks. I I wish that we could have gone together, but I also <laughs> often kind of am tickled at the idea of, of you just <laughs> in this room with all these total, total nerds, total book nerds, totally not mosquito nerds, not tick nerds, but um, artist book nerds. And how, what a weird experience that was. I, I loved it. They were very friendly and fun and <laughs> they were total nerds. And it was funny to, to see this other nerd subculture. Yeah. yeah. I think what I'm hearing as you guys talk about this is how much collaboration turns into sort of conceptualizing each other as your audience mm -hmm. in this really nice way. Like, um, when you're talking about this, the care that each of you go into to be able to understand and translate and make legible each other's contributions has been, you know, I think if, if um, you know, if a studio artist and an ecologist can find a way to communicate about these things, then perhaps it broadens the audience out to a, a lot of other people in a way. Oh, Catherine's got a question. Hi, Catherine. What, what do you, what, what's up? Uh, hello. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, just on that point that Sarah was making there, it's so interesting, this project and is, uh, the ability to speak across different disciplines, like speaking to each other and finding uh, common ground is in the AXA translation project as a whole. It's an incredibly hopeful project, I find. Like so much about academia is about these academic uh, silos. Each discipline becomes a silo. And it's very hard to 
talk across disciplines often uh, for people to communicate with each other. And you're making that happen in this book, The Acts of Translation, across so many very different disciplines. Uh, so I find an incredible sense of, of hopefulness in that, uh, of community. And I was wondering if you could both just speak a little bit about the uh, the rewards of that type of work, but also I, I assume the challenges. It's not easy to to hop from one silo to another to create meaningful communication. To be, the act of translation is a difficult thing to do. So if you could speak a bit about the, the challenges and the rewards of this type of interdisciplinary uh, communication and community. I'll start and say that, um, first of all, thank you, Catherine. You know, I, I think this book has been unexpectedly meaningful for me. Firstly, because I am having to go outside of my experience and spend a lot of time listening to people about kind of intersecting issues that it, I just feel like I get to inhabit all of these worlds and it gives me this opportunity to, I don't know, think about all these folks in a different way. Also, it's just fun to get to know their, like I get to know these people more deeply, some of whom I didn't know very well to begin with. Others like Dave, you know, obviously we've known each other forever and, but I feel like I know him better now after having completed this book. I, um, I'm off the track. I don't even remember what I'm saying anymore, except to say that um, I initially with each of these components of this book, there was always a moment where I was like, I don't think this is going to work. You know, I don't, this isn't coming together. And then you just have to like buckle up and knuckle down or do whatever, <laughs> whatever, everything makes the most sense. And then you find that connecting point. And once the connecting point is there, then it just comes really naturally, which isn't to say there isn't tons and tons of work to edit it and agree about it and, you know, make a kind of cohesive thought out of all of these conversations. Um, but with every single one, I thought, I, I'm not sure I can make this work. But once I got over that hurdle, now I feel like I could make a book with anybody. I could make a book with anybody. Everybody has something to say and everybody has this. I mean, I, I know I'll move on and I'll do a different project, but I feel like I could do this project a hundred times. Mm. I could do this project for the rest of my life and I would be satisfied because it has been so rewarding to spend all of this. I actually feel quite emotional about the project. It's funny because it's coming to a close now and I had to write the colophon which is normally in a book, it's just like, this book is made of this and this is my process. And this is, you know, the typeface is la -di -la -di -la. <laughs> 2000 and something signature here, edition one out of 50. But this time I was just like agonizing about what to say because I wanted to say thank you because it has meant a lot to me to make this book. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Now I've rambled and I've lost, I've lost the track. So that um no i'm ready to answer that because um i found this uh like sarah said i i also was like what is going on here like i don't understand what this is going to be and i think that for me some of the challenges is i want it to be so literal and so mm -hmm. i i think with the first project it, it felt more like okay like we're just finding this new way to display the data and we can describe what we're doing versus here, like, okay, I want to tell you about how the model works. And I want to be very explicit about like the point of the book is to tell people about my model or to tell me about to people about tick populations. Cause that's what I do. I'm a scientist. Um, and I'm describing my, and so what I think when Sarah was like, no, we're, we're interested in the translation. We're not actually trying to describe your model. And I was like, wait, no, but like, that's that's what we're doing. We're describing my model. And so I think that that was what was challenging for me is just saying like, that was that d difference. Um, and then obviously the, the rewards are, I mean, A, it's just like super fun to work with Sarah. And so thank you, Sarah. And B, it's, I mean, as a, as a scientist, it's just so rewarding to be in it in a different type of creative discipline because I mean, science has, um, creative outlets in terms of designing experiments and thinking about the structure of a model, but then it 
I mean, and I think this is obviously true for Sarah too, where there's creative parts and then there's like totally like meticulous, fussy rote parts. Um, and I guess I didn't have to do those parts for this project. And so just, you know, working with an artist and thinking outside my discipline is, is obviously so rewarding. And then being forced to describe something in a way that, you know, that, that, um, that, that that's more broadly understood is is a, obviously a very very important process for anybody. I think that I had to have a lot of faith in doing this pro because this project has taken place over a number of years. I identified collaborators and worked with them. I finished Allison Grant um, her component first. That obviously helped. Once one was done, I kind of knew the form things were going to take. And I, it, it, at least in terms of dimensions, you know, and typeface, because I'm keeping those things consistent paper. But with each, I had to just move forward with each collaboration, having a belief that they would echo and work together and not worry too much. This book is different from all of my other books because all of my other books, I have completely designed it and worked it through before production. This book happened in stages where I would be working on the design of one project while I had already printed another and one of them was already bound and being sold in different places. And so it just was kind of almost a little out of my control and I felt a little out of control. And it's only now that all the components are done not, I mean, I'm binding them over there, but they're designed, they're printed. There isn't any more of that kind of work to be done. Now I can take a step back and look. And I'm I'm finding these beautiful things. Like each of these people is using language. Like Dave describes his last words in his book, or my last words that mm -hmm. I picked for him, I should say, uh, is that I exist in the middle. I am a flux between the natural world and the code. Dave Allen, Dave Allen, uh, Ben Mitchell, the type designer, he talks about how, so he's designing Southeast Asian scripts, extensions of uh, fonts. Uh, so he'll be designing the Burmese or the Khmer um, for a, 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 a digital design that already exists in Latin, what we use. So he says, you know, I'm, I'm a link. I can be a link between language communities and the computer. Um, people are using that language. Like I'm a bridge, I'm a link, I'm a, I'm a, oh, uh, Luveda Harrison, Luveda, she said something so beautiful about being a, a connection. I, I'm using the words, I can't remember exactly, but a connection between the composer and the audience. Like she, that's her role. She's mm. this connection. Everyone is talking about themselves as this point of connection. And it, it, it echoes so beautifully altogether. And that wasn't my intention, you know, at least not in the beginning. Toward the end, I had a little bit more of an idea. But these things sort of evolved. And each of these projects, they're very simple on their own. And that was part of what was hard for me because Dave, I wanted to tell everyone about your model. Don't get me wrong, your model is awesome. Just like I wanted to tell everybody about how Ben Mitchell um, writes Unicode proposals in his free time for no money to, to make uh, like language communities have access to digital tools, right? Like everyone here is so interesting. Everyone's doing such amazing stuff. And I want to tell everyone everything about them, but I had mm -hmm. to use only one tiny fraction of what we were talking about and then have hope that when it all came together, it would become a more complicated and sort of resonant project. So anyway, that. This has been so amazing. I want to make sure that anyone else has a chance to ask any questions before we wrap up. Um, but I have enjoyed this talk so very much. Me too. Thank you so much for inviting us, Sarah. Yeah. And thank you, Dave, for, you know, continuing to work with me. I love all the things we do together, even the projects that we make that we don't finish or don't work. I mean, it's not like everything we try to do works out just mm -hmm. like any, any other project and anyone else's research. And, you know, we're all just starting a lot of things and finishing some of them. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> no, I've enjoyed so much. And thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction or the invitation for this uh, talk. Absolutely. I just appreciate you sharing 
your work with our ADHC community. Um, and the time has come for us to wrap up mm -hmm. this podcast. So I will just leave you with a thank you. I want to just say thank you to the folks who are here. I know that um, some people will tune in later, but Catherine, thank you for coming. Larry and uh, and my mother. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see all of you. And uh, Sarah, especially big thanks to you. Absolutely.